Well, well, well. Some of you have been requesting a video about who was in the control room on the night of the disaster, and I am more than happy to give it to you. As you'd expect, with the turbine rundown experiment in progress, there are a lot of people to go through, from reactor engineers to electricians. Guess how many people were actually in the control room, and see how close you get. I'll be revealing the final number at the end of the video. So, this is the approximate position of everyone in the control room at 1.23.39am, the exact second AZ-5 is pressed. But first, we need to address the elephant's foot in the room. Sorry for the bad joke. Either side of the control room are two rooms filled with various computers and data outputs, the non-operational control room, or CRN. There were, in fact, two people in this room. The first was Anatoly Pinchuk, monitoring measurements from the oscillograph recording the results of the experiment. Somewhere else in the room was the assistant of Gennady Metlenko, a man we will talk about later, monitoring the actions of the switchgear. After the explosion, they would turn in their shifts and head back to Pripyat. They played a small role in the mitigation of the disaster. And now, on to the main control room. Let's first take a look at the most iconic desk, or pult, as they are officially known. Of course, this is the reactor pult. The person directly in front of the rod selection and AZ-5 is Leonid Toptonov, not Akimov, as he's often wrongly fought. Toptonov was, of course, the 25-year-old senior reactor control engineer controlling the reactor that night. Three years of training experience and seven months of solo operation of the reactor under his belt, Toptonov had encountered difficulties throughout the night, and at some point did step aside to allow others to step in and help raise the power back to 200 megawatts. Toptonov would receive a fatal dose of radiation while inside room 714 stroke 2, attempting to open the valves of the emergency core coolant system, while contaminated water from the steam separators poured in from above. Behind Toptonov, we have a few people who were observing him, and were unfortunate enough to find themselves caught up in the disaster that would follow, when they weren't even supposed to be there. Viktor Proskuryakov and Alexander Kudryavstev were both senior mechanical engineers who had been given the prestigious opportunity to become senior reactor control engineers like Toptonov in Unit 5, and when they heard the rundown had been delayed to the night shift, both decided to take the bus from Pripyat to the nuclear power plant to observe the rundown. They did, in fact, get involved with the attempts to raise the power and continued to watch to observe the shutdown process. Of course, we all know how this will end. The two of them spent virtually the entire night together, accessing the reactor hall after previous failed attempts by climbing up to the reserve refueling machine control room. They too would also receive a high dose in room 714 stroke 2, and despite evacuating around 4am, they would also succumb to radiation exposure. Close by is Valery Perovozchenko. Now, I know a lot of people do believe that Perovozchenko did the famous mad run from the reactor hall to the control room, but it's not true. One of my first videos was about how he would have to run at 15% the speed of sound to do it, which is obviously impossible. However, Perovozchenko was called to the control room, and saw the rundown unfold. As the head of the reactor shop, he was interested in seeing how the reactor would behave. Perovozchenko would lead Proskuryakov and Kudryavstev to the reactor hall and 714 stroke 2, but was also in charge of finding missing employees as part of his duties as head of the reactor shop. This included Valery Hodomchuk, and Perovozchenko even climbed across the collapsed remains of the pump hall 
unable to locate his body, and eventually dying after a long battle against radiation sickness, succumbing to a cerebral edema. And rounding out this group is Yuri Tregub. Now, Tregub was the shift supervisor for the previous shift, and oversaw some of the preparations leading up to the experiment, and the start of the reduction in power leading to the experiment. When the power drop occurred, it is largely agreed that Tregub was one of the major people involved in getting the power back up to 200 megawatts, and then he waited to see how the turbine and other systems would behave during the rundown. Tregub also went to room 714 stroke 2, but was saved by its wooden door, as he visited within minutes of the explosion. As a result of the steam and all of the heat, the door swelled up in the frame, making it impossible to open. Tregub also participated in efforts to restart the feed water flow, and eventually left the site at sunrise. There is little known about his fate as of today, but he's given lectures on nuclear physics in recent years. Between the reactor and pump desks is the deputy chief engineer Anatoly Dyatlov. Dyatlov was the man who wrote the operating instructions for the turbine rundown program, and was overseeing its implementation. After the explosion, he would be de facto in charge of organising the disaster response. From surveying the damage to searching for Hodomchuk, Dyatlov was involved in a lot of things. During his tour of the damaged building, he waded through knee-deep water that was escaping the reactor resulting in severe leg injuries, leaving him rendered unable to walk for any great period of time, succumbing to radiation-induced bone marrow cancer in 1995. At the pump desk, there was only one person. This was Boris Stolyachuk, the Senior Block Control Engineer, or SIUB. Not only did Stolyachuk control the eight main circulation pumps pumping water through the reactor, but also the feed water flow rate and the operation of all the numerous systems running through the building. Stolyachuk was responsible for the rapid increases and decreases in feed water that would place the reactor in the dangerous situation, albeit unknowingly and following his training and regulations. Despite spending most of his shift in the control room, he did also spend time in the turbine hall, giving him a not insignificant dose. Fun fact, Stolyachuk was, at one point, Deputy Chief State Inspector for Nuclear and Radiation Safety, and even held the position of Acting Chairman of the State Nuclear Regulatory Authority in 2017. And then to his right is the turbine desk, and here we have a large gathering of people. Of course, the person operating Turbine 8 was Igor Kirschenbaum. Like Toptonov and Stoyachuk, he had had a difficult yet not worrying shift as a result of the power drop. The steam flow of the turbine was brought down to almost zero, nearly causing a premature shutdown that would have scrammed the reactor. Kirschenbaum did survive the disaster, and has avoided the press and interviews about the accident. He lives in Israel. The man who guided Kirschenbaum through the difficulties of avoiding the premature shutdown was Razim Davletbaev. As the deputy head of the turbine workshop, Davletbaev oversaw the maintenance of all eight turbines, and had only come to Unit 4's control room to finish his list of maintenance needed to be carried out on the turbines and then he was going to travel back to Pripyat with the crew of the Mercedes in the turbine hall. Davletbaev largely spent time fighting the fires in the turbine hall, and aiding Unit 3 as they went into their shutdown. Unfortunately, Razim Davletbaev passed away in 2017. And then there is Kirschenbaum's observer. Sergei Gazin was the senior turbine control engineer from the preceding shift, and stayed with Tregub to observe the rundown. After the explosion, Gazin followed Tregub to room 714-2, stroke 2, 
but was also unable to access it. On his way from control room 3 to 4, carrying gas masks, he was stopped by a dosimetrist and sent to get changed and decontaminated. When he returned to the control room and asked if there was anything else he could do, he was sent back to Pripyat. To the back of the control room, we now have lots of more people. And a wave of obscurity. Some of these people we only know the full names of because they were interrogated by the KGB, let alone have photos of them. At the back of the control room are another series of panels, one Yi and two Yi, which are being monitored by Victor Suryadny and Alexander Bordash, respectively. Suryadny would initially fight fires in the turbine hall, even encountering Gemrik, Kyrgyz, Simonenko and Semikopov attempting to evacuate the building, and help them escape. Afterwards, he was sent to Central Control Room 1 to receive orders from Rogozhkin, where he was told to evacuate to the main administration building, likely saving him from a high radiation dose in the turbine hall. Bordash initially separated from Suryavni in an attempt to make his own way to Control Room 3. However, they did reunite and evacuate together to ABK-1, and spent the rest of their shifts there. Behind Suryadny was Alexander Orlenko, who was the supervisor of the electrical department. Orlenko organised the mission by the electricians to turn off the machinery in, and close the piping from, the electrolysis building, hoping to limit their dose by moving away from the radioactive contamination. Unfortunately, having the opposite effect. He was also one of the first senior workers to be informed about the presence of graphite in the rubble, when a trainee asked him why it was there. He would leave at 11.30am, the last person present in the control room to leave. To the right of these men is Piotr Palamachuk. Palamachuk was the deputy head of the Chernobyl Commissioning Enterprise, which was mandatorily present for all startups and shutdowns, and two of their crew had been borrowed for the experiment. One of these was Anatoly Shevchuk, and the other was Vladimir Shashinok, who was struck by collapsing debris and trapped as the corridor flooded with scalding water, partially hanging out of the building. Palamachuk helped rescue Shashinok with the dosimetrist Gorbachenko, and today the two men still have matching radiation-related skin damage corresponding to where they held Shashnok on their backs. And close to Palamachuk is the man who had borrowed his engineers, Gennady Metlenko, the lead designer from Dontek Energo, the mastermind behind the turbine rundown experiment. This was Metlenko's third time attempting it. In 1983, the turbines were shown to be unable to sustain the flywheel effect needed. And in 1984, they were unable to collect any data from the turbine. Metlenko had been brought back after missing the failed 1985 experiment. And this time, they were determined to get it right. After the explosion, Metlenko would coordinate with the other employees of Dontek Energo and was then asked to activate the feed water pumps in the turbine hall. Finding them blocked by smoke and debris, he returned to the control room and was told to evacuate the building with the rest of Dontek and Ergo. They did, at 2am. Behind the shift supervisor's desk, we have three people. The first is Grigory Lysiuk. Lysiuk was the electrician that was ordered to press the design basis accident button that triggered the rundown. He was in fact late to press it, as he misinterpreted the command. Lysiuk left the control room shortly after the accident, with Engineer Mole. The two cleared debris from the corridors, allowing people to safely access or escape Unit 4, and then Lysiuk evacuated to the second administration building. The second and third are Alexander Kukar and Alexander Lelachenko. The two of them 
were in the central control room too, when the rundown began, and ran to the room around the end of the experiment to observe it from there. After the explosion, Kukar would make his way to the switchgears, switching on electrical feeds to restore power to Unit 4. Afterwards, he would evacuate to Unit 3 when it became apparent he was no longer needed. Lelachenko, however, was needed. Within minutes after the explosion, he and a small amassed army of electricians, all of whom would later die, went outside to cut the hydrogen supply to the turbine hall, thus preventing a large hydrogen explosion. Over the next few hours, Lelachenko was seen battling the flames and water in the cable corridors, cutting the electrical supply to parts of the building, and even seen in the turbine hall at some points. He was taken to the hospital during the night, but returned to the nuclear power plant and continued working throughout the day. He went back home to Pripyat that afternoon, rested, had a meal with his wife, and got some sleep. He returned on April 27th, and stayed there until the evening working away, at which point he was brought to the summer camp already being set up as a base for plant employees, and in early May he was taken to Kiev, where he became the first victim of radiation poisoning. And finally, completing our circle of the control room, we have the shift supervisor, Alexander Akimov. He was in charge of the entire shift that night, coordinating what was supposed to be a shutdown reactor, and then the turbine rundown, and then the disaster efforts. Many decisions, including the continuous supply of water, were his orders, and he would pay the price. He received a fatal dose in room 714 stroke 2, like Toptonov and many others. While many today look on it as a pointless waste of human lives, the leading members of the government commission praise Akimov for his heroism and his decision making, stating that the influx of water suppressed steam and smoke releases long enough to evacuate many major settlements before serious radioactive contamination took place, including Pripyat. And that's about it in terms of people, who they were, and what they did. That is 21 people in the control room at that very moment. A very cramped space indeed. Thank you all for the suggestion, and I hope you enjoyed the video.